Okay, I've been asked to kick things off tonight with a brief introduction to nano, nanomaterials, nanoscience, and give a little context for some of the things that you're going to be hearing about from the rest of the speakers tonight. So let me try and do that in a way that is uh, clear for everybody, and, and then towards the end, when we're up here at the panel, we'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Nanomaterials, first off, are not new. Nanomaterials were developed by nature long before we came along. Nature has been very clever about how to make very, very sophisticated structures. What we are able to do today is look at those structures. We are trying to understand how they are made and how they work. Today, though, nature is still much better at making things at the nanoscale than we are. However, we're making progress, and a lot of that progress is due to advances in microscopy. You're going to hear a little bit more about this this evening. The soup of acronyms that I've got up here all relate to different types of microscopes that have been developed over the past two decades. The scanning electron microscope, the atomic force microscope, each of these are tools that are critical for us to be able to zoom in and see structures at the nanoscale. These are tools that were not available in the 50s or the 60s or even the 70s, at least with the resolution that we have today. And that is why nanotechnology is happening today rather than 50 years ago. The nanotechnology revolution will occur because of the availability of these tools. Now, what are we able to do? With these tools, we're now able to zoom in on, and see the wide variety of materials. Not just the materials that nature makes, but the, the materials that we are able to make in chemistry and chemical engineering labs here on campus and around the world. So, for example, new spherical particles that might have possible applications in, uh, as lubricants and coatings. Uh, long tendrils or fibrils that can be woven into uh, traditional fabrics or uh, added to plastics to make new types of composites. As well, uh, electrically conductive and semiconductor fibers that can act as wires in miniature electronic circuits. These are all the different kinds of nanomaterials that scientists have been working on over the past decade or so now that they have access to these, these new microscopes that I introduced you to. Now, putting these materials to work, that's the conversion of, of nanomaterials into true technology. And the early technologies that we have today are actually still pretty simple. It's a matter of taking advantage of the properties of these materials and mixing them into composites or, or coatings, such as paint, the paint on the ceiling in here, in this room, has uh, nanoscale titanium dioxide particles. There are products today on the market in which nanoscale particles are being added to lubricants, to sunscreens, to fabrics, to try and enhance those properties, to enhance the, the, the strength of the plastic car bumper, for example, on, on the tail of your, of your auto. Now, this is not what people envisioned for nanotechnology. It's certainly not what Bill Clinton was talking about 10 years ago when he, when he proposed the National Nanotechnology Initiative. Instead, people advanced much more progressive ideas. The idea of nanoscale robots, nanoscale machines, nanoscale communicators and control systems, things that could really do stuff, but just at the small nanoscale. We don't know how to do most of that today. We don't have the science for doing most of that yet. Nanoscale is a fast-moving and rapidly advancing field. Today we have some interesting nano applications such as paint and lubricants and plastics. We hope someday to be able to build these sorts of advanced nanotechnologies of the future. Now, this comes from 1966. And so Hollywood had this all figured out long before the physicists and the engineers. In this scheme, Raquel Welch was going to shrink down to the nano scale, climb inside a, 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 a spaceship, essentially, and pilot it to your brain to fix a blood clot. Now, over the past few decades, we've realized that that's probably not going to happen. But we've scaled back our vision. And we've scaled it back in a way that we think is, is scientifically reasonable. So instead of shrinking Ra Raquel Welch down, instead we're going to make small particles that, that carry the necessary pharmaceuticals. Maybe these are particles like Michael was just referring to that, that have some electronic communication from, from inside your body to outside your body. And this was uh, uh, described for the first time and, and popularized in the 90s as nanomaterials and, and nanomicroscopy really began to take off. 
Today, what we have is wrinkle-resistant shirts. Right now, you can go to the Gap or, or, or Eddie Bauer and buy some nice pants that are stain repellent. That's not quite the same as sending a nanorobot into your heart to, to repair an artery, but, but it's the stage that we're at today with, with real science. The hope is that, as in the past, science fiction will continue to turn into science fact as we make new discoveries and, and uh, uh, make new steps in the engineering that makes use of these discoveries. My own research is in the area of electronic circuits and shrinking electronic circuits. I showed you some images of some of the world's smallest wires. It would be reasonable to ask, what exactly would you do with the world's smallest wires? In trying to address this, this question, we try to look at problems that occur at the single molecule scale. For example, understanding the complex binding that occurs between, for example, uh, proteins, enzymes, or other biomolecules. Some of the most complex systems in biochemistry are very poorly understood. We barely know the structure of these things. Here I've drawn them as, as spheres and, and, and sockets. But you can imagine much larger proteins, the, the single strand of a DNA. These are all uh, large macroscopic proteins and uh, uh, biomolecules that we don't understand them very well. So the premise here is to take the world's smallest wires and hook up to these systems to bind them together in a way that we can use the power of solid-state electronics to measure what's going on at the nanoscale, to measure what's happening with molecular precision. And that would be a, a, a general research area uh, which you could call the circuits of single molecules. And this is very active here at UCI as well as at other universities uh, and campuses around the world. Let me show you a, very briefly, briefly what this might look like. The pictures on the left are microscope images of some of our single molecule circuits. The arrows point to individual proteins that we have then wired up. The advantage of these circuits now is that we can monitor the behavior of that protein as, for example, it binds to its partners. That's something that's very, very difficult to do. And here we have a nice, clean electronic signal that tells us exactly what the protein is doing moment to moment. Here's another cartoon example. In this case, we've taken a protein that has enzymatic behavior. This is a, a lysozyme protein, which all of you have in your, in your tears. This is the way that you and I fight off certain types of bacterial infections. The lysozyme is known to, to chop up the invading bacteria, much like Raquel Welch would have done back in 1966. Now, there's lots of features of this lysozyme processing that are poorly understood. If we understood it better, we might be able to design new molecules that would be able to aid our innate uh, immune system. So one of our topics has been to go and, and try to understand how this lysozyme processes. Now when I link a lysozyme as shown here to one of our nano circuits, we're able to ge generate signals like the one I'm showing here at the bottom. The current of this device has sharp pulses at, at non-periodic places. Each one of those sharp pulses is the lysozyme chopping apart the, the substrate wall, chopping apart these fragments, which would normally be the, the cell wall that make up the bacteria. And so in this case, we have a nice clean electronic signal that shows us the chopping action of this lysozyme molecule. Now, to extend this further, we can go and look at a variety of different proteins. We can look at different mutants of the same protein. We can look at different substrates in order to understand how exactly does an inhibitor work? How exactly does a particular mutation change the behavior of the protein overall? Where one protein might be very effective at processing, whereas with a single point mutation, it becomes much, much less so. With a single molecule circuit, with the ability to watch reactions happening with single molecule resolution, we're able to answer these kinds of questions with the hope of being able to design new sort of, to, sorry, to understand mutations and modifications, as well as design drugs that would be able to take advantage of certain uh, mutations by targeting them, or perhaps by inhibiting certain interactions. Did I do that?
No, apparently I didn't. <laughs> All right, with that, I'd like to conclude. That's a very, very brief introduction to kind of the history behind the nano revolution, the material side of it, the microscopy, the science that's going on, and one aspect of nanotechnology, taking these very, very small wires and turning them into circuits that have certain implications for, for healthcare and, and pharmaceutical development. Thank you very much.